Hello, everybody. This is episode 300, and my guest today is Bear Herbert, who experienced multiple strokes, has suffered from spontaneous bouts of being unable to speak, and has experienced out of body experiences where he's able to observe himself from a different perspective. Bear Herbert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and honor. It's lovely Truly to have you here. Most sincerely. My pleasure. My pleasure. Tell me a little bit about what happened to you, Bear. Um, it is quite convoluted. However, I have been going nonverbal since quite young after uh, probably seven was the first time. And um, been going through those things my entire life. My parents would take me to the medical facilities and they would do testing and said that I was emotionally and mentally fatigued. And as a seven-year-old, I'm just thinking, I can't talk, what's going on here? Fast forward to 2015, me and my family was back in Central Oregon <clears throat> and I had a massive stroke and went to Bend Regency. I was diagnosed with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome at that time, a clotting disorder, also known as Hughes disorder, sticky blood disorder. And then fast forward to 2002, um, I went catastrophic, which means I was producing blood clots in three or more organs in my body at once. And to that point, for seven years, I'd just been spitting up blood clots like doc holiday almost and um that's when i got diagnosed with caps which is a rare neurological disorder that the demographics on are so small there is almost none available and it helped me understand that i've been having strokes my entire life of sub different sizes and when i went catastrophic they um I'm able to see things in my own way. I'm very much ethereal in nature like we all are, but I understand who I am and where I'm from. And the doctors, I saw their hearts in the way that I can see, and they all viewed me as their kid brother. And so I thought, well, even if they don't know what they're doing, they're not going to try to kill their kid brother. So I said yes to what they wanted to do. And they saved my life. And um, when I was in there, I had hundreds of heart attacks. I have a um, bicuspid valve in my heart, so my heart don't close all the way. And also, um, the doctors came in. I told them, I'm having strokes right now. And they told me, no, you're not. Your face isn't dripping, none of that stuff. And I said, trust me, please. And they left and came back in 20 minutes later and put me in the MRI machine. I was in there for an obnoxious amount of time. I can't remember how long he said, but it was like six hours or something. And I kept having, why they kept me in there so long is I kept having just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of small strokes everywhere. And they wasn't able to pinpoint them or count them. So they tell me that I've had an innumerable amount of strokes at this point. And that's kind of how things uh, got more formulated to what's happening. And I've been working with Abilitry. They are an independent company here in Bend, Oregon, helping disabled people stay independent. And the worst part of my journey was um, being in convalescent centers and not being with my family also being nonverbal in those centers and the bad things that happen from the staff to nonverbal people they think they're just invalids i guess and so right now i am on a great adventure i have a gift of foresight i've always had and we are going to be um, producing um, facilities in crook county oregon and they're going to be 3D printed with hempcrete. I have one of people that I've known in the past that does that. And we're gonna 
print these buildings and there's going to be a healing and recovery center for families to be able to go and recover if they want together as a unit. Mm -hmm. And then also there's going to be um, a vocational center attached to that that is going to teach basic skills of all the different things I've done through my different stroke recoveries that's really helped me. We'll be back with my guest in a minute. But first, let me tell you about my new book called The Unexpected Way That a Stroke Became the Best Thing That Happened, 10 Tools for Personal Transformation. It tells the story of 10 stroke survivors and the steps they took that got them to the stage in their recovery where, from a personal growth perspective, stroke transformed into one of those life experiences that on reflection was filled with many opportunities for growth and personal transformation. In the book, there are chapters on nutrition, sleep, exercise, how to deal with the emotional side of stroke, tips and tools for mental well-being, and much, much more. To find out more, go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash book. To grab a copy from Amazon in your part of the world, just go to amazon.com, type my name, Bill Gassiamis, into the search bar, and you will get results for delivery to your place from wherever you are in the world. And in the healing center, there's going to be a lot of frequency devices and um, harmonic, harmonic healing. So it's kind of things that used to be considered woo-woo not so long ago, but now the science is catching up mainstream to understanding what's happening. And me being a veil walker, that's what I consider myself, leaving this human suit so many times and coming back to it. I have access to the other realms. And so I've seen these um, frequencies and different lights and things that I knew would heal me. And so in 2015, I tried to find some and I found some. They were red light machines, but I ended up getting an Care device from Prife International. And I used that on myself. And um, yeah, so that's kind All of right. what it is. And All right. Thank so you. your experience with being nonverbal you were nonverbal until the age of seven? No, I was verbal. I was talking at a very, very young age. It kind of scared my parents because I was talking at a very young age and I tell them things and things I saw. And because I'm this way, I was born in 83 as a um, dead baby to a lupus patient with the cord wrapped around my throat for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I've always had this way of being and it really freaked my parents out when I was younger saying things and telling them what I was, who I was talking to and all those sorts of things, <laughs> you know, I can mm -hmm. imagine really just dis disorienting from them. But mm -hmm. when I was seven, that was the first time I went nonverbal because of uh, some sort of physical um, injury. I was riding on the front of a four wheeler with my cousin and another cousin came over the hill and we hit head on and my knees were in the middle. And I just, I couldn't talk for about three weeks. Uh -huh. and, and then I started talking again and everybody's talking about I'm just a drama queen. <laughs> uh -huh. So then it became just something that happened, something that you did rather than something that happened to you. And then you were better for quite a long time. Did you have any... Um, situations where things went off track after that while you were there was a lot of times that I things happened that I went nonverbal since then through childhood but I'd always be going to the hospitals and then doing tests and saying that I'm just mentally and emotionally fatigued and mm -hmm. um, that's a crock diagnosis. crap yeah and then so when I was an adult, I had made my um, living in the oil field, drilling gas holes for assholes and um, kind of the funny vernacular. But I was doing that and operating cranes and heavy equipment and stuff. And my boss came in one day to the field and picked me up and looked at me and said, I don't know what you're doing but I've been keep talking to you on the phone and you won't answer me. Mm -hmm. And I answered him and he's like, 
you, no words are coming out of your mouth there. And I just uh, shocked me because I was talking to him on the phone and he hung up and come got me. But I was 32 at that time and I went to the emergency room and they did the same thing. They did a bunch of tests and stuff and they said that I was just emotionally and mentally fatigued. And so at that time, I kind of had to stop working for other people. And so I, this shirt I have on is Herbert's Decorative Concrete. I ended up building four businesses in four years. And just every time I go through a stroke, I get on a different savant. Something comes to me in the, in the veil and I have to know all I can understand about it or else my spirit isn't satisfied. Mm -hmm. And I've done all sorts of dogma studies and different things and blah, blah, blah. So just before but, we go there, before we go there, let's go back to your employer. Did your employer, did you go and get yourself checked out to see why somebody said you were nonverbal and you thought you were responding and they couldn't tell that you were responding? Did you go to the hospital yeah, to go he, through he, that process? Yeah, that's where he took me was to the emergency room. Uh, uh -huh. And it was Christmas Day, actually. Were you aware and that you had no, you weren't talking at that time? And did it come? No, I thought I, I thought words were coming out of my mouth. And then I actually looked at myself talking to myself in the mirror and my mouth wasn't even freaking moving. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Uh -huh. So it was a weird disconnect with my nervous system and everything just I was pulled away from myself mm -hmm. and um, it happened again when I was doing my decorative concrete stuff. I was doing epoxies and I got um, USDA approval for indoor labs, horticultural centers and clean rooms. So I got picked up by the cannabis industry and stuff. And I did research before about um, plant-based medicines. And it was really selfish kind of a deal, what I could do to help little kids like my little brother not have to go through the things we went through with our parents if we would have known. And so we ended up getting cannabis legal items in the state of Utah for medical use. And then I was doing some floors at home and went nonverbal. And I called my little brother and just kind of wept, let out a whimper. And he says, oh my God, give me a pin where you're at, I'm gonna come help you. So I did, and he showed up and he had a whiteboard with him, one of the, with the markers. Mm -hmm. And I was crying, there was little tears coming out of my face. And he says, we can do this, buddy. Remember Legends of the Fall? And he curled his face up and he writes, fuck them, and starts laughing. And I start crying. <laughs> He's like, don't cry, man. Just write down what you need me to do and we'll do this. And so we got this floors done and stuff without me being able to even talk. And um, that happened quite a bit. That and then happened quite a bit. Here. So at what age was that? Um, that was starting when I was 32. Mm -hmm. And 
I ran my businesses for three or four years and kept having more strokes and more strokes and just weird things happening. Did anyone ever diagnose a stroke during those nonverbal episodes? No, yeah. not at all. That's the part that made me so apoplectic. I was just completely besides myself. Mm. And so when I got here to Oregon, again, I've lived half my life in central, um, not central, but northeastern Colorado, not sorry, Utah on the Ute Reservation and half my life here in central Oregon. And there's better facilities here and a lot better trained staff, I believe. And that's when I got diagnosed with um, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Okay. And Does was that, able to understand what was happening. Was that a good diagnosis from, from the perspective of, aha, here we go, we've got something to work with or we've got some kind of an answer. And does that make you feel like perhaps it explains some of your childhood and some of the things that you experienced medic, uh, from a medical perspective when you were younger? It, it didn't as far as flush things out from my youth. It was still that part was still an enigma to me in every facet. However, in um, I got some basis to understand things and what was going on with my blood and blah blah blah. But in 2002, when I went catastrophic, um, that was the real keystone for my understanding. When Dr. Carr came in and he told me this is what's going on. I believe he started asking me questions. Did I have um, a memory of extremely high temperatures, fevers when I was a kid? Um, have I ever went um, had a bad infection and different things? And my appendix was ruptured for seven days my senior year of high school. And I didn't get my antibiotics after I got out. And so it my stomach opened again. So there was a lot of things that he could check, check, check. Oh my God, this is what's going on. And when I got that CAPS diagnosis, that's when clarity came to me. I'm like, whoa. What's CAPS again? Um, I had a bunch of stuff pulled up so I could read it all to you, but I'm disheveled and I haven't been able to right now. Let but, me see if um, I can find it. So is it a acronym CAPS? Yes. It's a neurological disorder that um, expresses itself sporadically. And the Let's doctor see. that I saw, he's actually seen two of us. Let's see if it has a description. Caps neurological disorder. It is. But I'd like to tell me what, what CAP stands for. Hang on. Crypto. Uh, cryoprin associated periodic syndrome there you whatever, go <laughs> whatever that means it's a mouthful <laughs> cryoprin associated periodic syndrome okay and what does caps do to somebody do you have at least do you know that um for me i have a super esoteric soul because of what I've been through in the bell so much, but what it does to me is there's a phenomenon in the UFOlogy world that's called um, apotheum, the apotheum effect. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it does to me because I feel like my whole life I've lived in this mystic prelude of this grand mystery of creation and I've been an intimate um, orchestrator of said events in my life. Mm -hmm. I feel and understand that I've actually been there and done these things. So for me, I get a really disconnected feeling from my body. And I'm here at my neurokinetic therapist's office right now. I'm going to help him do some stuff in a minute. But that was a key for me in my healing was this neurokinetic therapy uh -huh. because it I was pissed when I first came because he put me squarely back in my human suit for the first time in my entire life. 
because uh-huh. I spend most of my time in the ethereal realm just having fun without filling my body. Okay. And I right. knew I had to fill my body to heal. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> okay. So let's let's break this down. So when I did a, a search for CAPS and what the symptoms are, nowhere there, Bear, does it say you have out-of-body experiences or you're living in the ethereal realm. No, no way they yeah. say that. What it says is periodic episodes of skin rashes, fever, and joint pain. And yep. it says these episodes can be triggered by exposure to cold temperatures, fatigue, other stressors, or they may arise spontaneously. Episodes can last from a few hours to several days. So but- my whole body looks like I've been burned excessively all over my skin and that's when a flare have happens and they actually get big giant welts on them uh-huh and it's very painful uh-huh and they just occur yeah and my eyes another thing is my eyes whenever i'm at caps flare my eyes get really bloodshot and really painful uh-huh and I guess I told you a little bit more than I needed to or should have about how I experienced stuff. No, no, you and didn't. I understand. What, what's really cool? What's really cool is that what now, because I'm such an expert in diagnosing people and all these things, right? To me, what it sounds like in order to deal with such, um, such what seem like you know very dramatic physical f- experiences and feelings you've become good at disassociating yourself from the physical experiences in a way to manage pain. And you, you go out of body and you go to this other place where you can exist and you can coexist with your physical self and not experience what most people would uh, probably have, you know, um, a very uncomfortable time experiencing. Um, Truly. So do you do you feel that maybe it's a uh, perhaps a, a, an a, an ability that you had that you've been able to develop and you've been able to get good at because you've had to deal with caps for such a long amount of time in your life? Yes and no. I didn't develop it. I was born with it, having this ability. Yeah. But what's been hard and what I've had to really work on mentally is the key that i gotta put into my head Mm -hmm. you gotta be in this human suit Mm -hmm. and that's the bottom line because i realized when 2016 when i had those strings of strokes um i went completely white my hair my face everything was white like i was 115 years old and now my hair's got color to it and stuff Mm -hmm. again but the reason why that happens is because um, when you're in your makaba, your human suit, um, white body, there's no light in your human suit to nourish it. And you can't do that. You'll atrophy in one way or another. And that's what I was doing and happy to do so. But now I realize I've got a mission and um, duh, you better get your ducks in a proverbial roll, young man, or you're not going to succeed. <laughs> uh huh. Are you stepping into your body more often, permanently? How do you experience your your day? How do you do that? Not not how do you specifically do that, but how do you spend time in one place or in another place, or have they combined? The craziest thing ever is. Um, sense i'm very very olfactory driven and um after those first sets of strokes um was living in a neighborhood and i don't know how people know things or whatever understand but anyways the human suits we have been hacked our dna for profit and every race has their own proclivity to certain um their own neurotoxins as far as laundry soaps and detergents. And at that time of that stroke event, when I got out of the nursing homes and stuff, um, 
I would go walking down out of my house and I would start having seizures because everybody's laundry detergent stuff. And so now how I found my neurokinetic therapist, he's across the thing from a nail polish place. I came with my elderly neighbor because there's a dentist there too, to help her support her to get her dentures. But that fingernail polish triggered me and all I could, all I was in the veil, all I could see was colors and different energies. And I walked by this office, neurokinetic therapy, and it says multidimensional healing, um, neurokinetic therapy and strength training. And I went to open the door like four times and talked myself out of it and walked away about the fifth time, a gentleman opened the door and he was really bitey. So I'm like, are you a stroke patient? And I kind of cocked my head like a dog at 20 degrees to kind of get a different view, you know? And he's not, but he has neurological issues as well. But smells is what will trigger me to just poof, get out of my body, whether I want to or not, and I have no control over it. And when you're and, out of your body, what do you experience that's different? So are you in your body now or out of your body now? I am in this human suit. I'm very aware of my nose on my face mm -hmm. and I can see you. I can see my hands when I'm out of my body. It depends on where I'm at. Um, I got diagnosed as cataplectic in 2002 as well. I got into a head on in 2001. I got this little teeny cut underneath my eyelid and I had a head on with a 2000 Peterbilt and it smashed my skull and my sinus cavities in. And I have not slept but one or two hours a night since then on average. But now I'm able to do more because of all these beautiful things. But when that happened, when the doctor diagnosed me with cataplexy, he asked me, he said, um, do you sleep blah, 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 and we're talking about it. And I told him, I'm not even here. He said, what do you mean you're not here? And I pointed back up to my right shoulder and I could see myself sitting up there watching. And he looks up and he says, what the hell are you looking at? <laughs> and I said, I'm looking at me talking to you. And he had something spilled on his shirt and I could see it from up there, but I couldn't, I wasn't in my body to actually see what was on his shirt, but I told him he had some mustard or whatever. And he's like, this is really creepy, Bear. I'm like, sorry, I don't mean to freak you out. Just, I'm trying to answer your questions. I don't understand my reality either. And I'm really <laughs> comfortable with making love to the mystery of, of what all this is. I love it. I love it that you're comfortable with that. Because I believe people when they tell me that they have these experiences, I don't mind. I don't get it. I don't know what it's like, but I'm, I'm cool with it. Like if that's what you're having, um, no problem. The um, cataplexy is the sudden loss of muscle tone while a person is awake. So you're, in your life, you have these interesting things that happen. One of them is uh, you go, you, you go nonverbal and there's, you're not, you don't know you're nonverbal and you try and communicate and it's, you think you're communicating, but the other person can't hear you. You also have yep. um, cataplexy, sudden loss of muscle tone while you're awake. So uh, is cataplexy something that you are aware of? You know that it's happened. How does it affect you? Do you not, uh, not able to stand up? Do you not able to walk? How does it work? That's usually when I disassociate is when that happens. And um, that's how that whole apotheum conversation and why starting got on mm -hmm. was because that's the closest thing I can relate it to that people might understand to grab a hold of. But um, I just go away from myself, but I'm also hyper, hyper, hyper aware. I have I have these glasses that I had on my face mm -hmm. and I took them off because um, if I have my glasses on, everything is clear to me to see because they're prescription glasses. But if I have them off, everything is a little bit fuzzy and I don't get hyper fixated on things and I'm able to have a conversation with people. 
So when I go into a business or a doctor's office, I take my glasses off so I can actually, instead of just zoning out on the details of their face and the colors of their eyes and just going off on some weird tangent in my own soul. Bear, that sounds like <laughs> a mushroom trip. It feels quite like one. I absolutely. Okay. Because I've had the pleasure a few times, right? So then um, what that reminded me of was when when I've had some um, mushrooms, what it's done is uh, made me hyper aware of things and looking at myself in the mirror is quite an experience. Now, some people listening to this podcast have never heard me talk about this kind of stuff before and they might be going, whoa, who is this guy? I'm not anyone that I don't have a life like bear, but I have a curiosity since the stroke about what life is about and what else is possible and what else we can see. And let me tell you that mushrooms, a small amount of mushrooms from the right person and all that kind of stuff in the right setup and the right location, um, which usually is in a dark room in my house. Um, it reminds Perfect. me, it reminds me of what you're saying. It's, it, it makes me see colors and sounds and, um, um, faces and voices and things that aren't there that I, I experience that are really pleasant to experience because it's in a controlled environment. I don't have to explain it to anybody. And, um, and it's quite, man, it's like holistic in that you, you feel your body, your spirit, you know, all your senses, everything is having the experience. It's just not it's just not my imagination. Do you know what I mean? It's beyond my imagination. Absolutely. I'm not imagining. I live in it. that place. Okay. All right. So, so I understand understand. you. Okay, cool. Well, that's what I'm trying to do is understand you. So it's not an imagination thing. It's a actual full experience. It's physical, it is, it's emotional, it's spiritual, it's everything. You are you um, familiar with um, C.S. Lewis and his writings? I'm not familiar with Chronicles his writings. Chronicles of Narnia or any of that stuff. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. I understand that. I know that book and movie. Yeah. He um, he was an author at the same time as um, Tolkien. Uh -huh. And they were both theologians. And that's what they were doing, writing allegories and all this stuff. And he's got a great book. It's called Into the Awe. That's where I live. I live in this mystic moment and I've have my whole life. And another cool thing, my oldest daughter, when she was in high school, um, she did a, a presentation for whatever it was in school, but I have um, synesthesia as well, but not ah. the classical synesthesia. It's okay. I have we need a to mental explain that one second, one second. We need to explain that. See, I'll bring it up. And I'm I'll a case, explain. brother. <laughs> you are, man. It's such a cool case from my perspective. I don't know what it's like to be. Likewise. Okay, great. That's excellent. So synesthesia is when your brain routes sensory information through multiple unrelated senses, causing you to experience more than one sense simultaneously. So so to give people who are listening an uh, understanding, it's like... That it too. Go again. Ratatouille, the movie about the rat. Yeah, tell me. That's synesthesia. When he's tasting the food and he's seeing all the colors and all the, it's the closest way I can touch it with somebody that, oh, and if they don't know the movie, they watch it and they're like, damn, that's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, so well, they, they get the experience of a sense like taste and they experience it also in colors and movement and perhaps even in sound and in a different feeling beyond just the flavor it's beyond the tongue it also happens elsewhere in the spiritual realm yeah okay and sometimes people can can um have synesthesia where they uh where a feeling an emotional feeling is beyond an emotional feeling it has a color it has a sound it has a whole theatrical experience that goes with it coolest thing i've ever experienced in that say phase phase of just 
discovery and um, recovery, my daughter took me to the um, Central Oregon Symphony. Oh, man. And it was just the most emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually elating, almost orgasmic experience because every every sense that i have in my body and i have a little bit more extra than most was just completely elated i was it was the most beautiful thing and we came out and there was big giant snowflakes just and the snowflakes was falling with the music i was just experiencing so it went with me for about four hours into the rest of my evening when we left <laughs> wow did you pay extra for that event because you sound like you should have paid extra i feel like i should have but <laughs> it was a, it was a free cool thing that my daughter was able to get in for us and it was pretty pretty enjoyable all right i i know we've like gone off the topic of stroke but we're going to get back there i promise we're going to talk about stroke but this is way more fun for right now um so you're how old are you now i just turned 40 last april 29th this okay. april 29th i'll be 41 you have a family what does the family situation look like um i have one son that's not any part of my life unfortunately and i have four daughters and um two of them are out of the house and i had the pleasure of enjoying my first granddaughter in November and my oldest daughter she graduated from COCC Community College with a degree in automotive and she's a lead mechanic for the city and then my 18 year old is at home with me and my 14 year old my 18 year old is going to COCC for aviation so she's flying around Bend right now and I actually enrolled at COCC myself to get my GED and also um, to explore things that I really know way more about than most human suits just because of who I am and what I've been through. Like Stone's talking to me and all this weird stuff. <laughs> but I want to learn from the professionals so I can hone in my speaking abilities and understand when I need to just shut up and listen and the things I need to say and not say uh -huh. that's my next goal in life <laughs> okay I love that so I was going to ask you about how your life has been because um I imagine that most people are not as receptive to your stories about what you're experiencing as I am and some people might even think that you need psychological or mental counseling or therapy and all that kind of stuff yeah right <laughs> okay so that's why I asked you about your family how do they, um, is there anyone else in your family that has some of this um, uh, experience that you have or are you the only one? No, nope, just me. Have you ever met anyone that's like you or similar to you in the world that you bumped into down the road somewhere and then they said, hey man. Somewhat. I've, um, I've got this way of being, like I said, and um, I am creator's noble heart for whatever that means to anybody. And so one of my jobs, I had my own business and I was going up the door late for work. It was my own schedule. So I'm the only one knew I was late putting boots on, jumping out of the, you know, into my truck. And there was a vehicle running off the road, down the road. He was trying to run people off. And I asked, creator and my guides to give me some advice here and that's what i always do i never get scared i never get scared but i've been very concerned a lot of times <laughs> and that's what i do i i ask my guides and creator to put wisdom in me or angelic human suits that have angelic hosts in my path to help me and that's what happens but this in particular event i got in front of the vehicle and was able to stop him and he ran into my truck a few times. But when I stopped him and got out to talk to him, I could tell he was having a massive stroke because my mom had strokes her whole life. My grandpa had strokes his whole life. 
So I'm very, very adept to it. I have watched my mom get resuscitated 14 times before I was 14 years old. And this man became a great friend. I saved his life. And me and my family went on this great hunt and did all this beautiful stuff. So I run into stroke patients all the time. It's divine appointments. Mm. Your, your ma, did you say your mom and your grandfather had strokes as well? Yeah. Oh, they have the same my condition? My grandpa had lupus. And okay. my mom did. Okay. All right. So that makes sense. So you have experienced that side of stroke regularly in that you know what to see, you know what to what it looks like, you know how to potentially visualize it and diagnose that somebody's unwell. Being being unwell in that particular way might be a stroke because you've seen it so many times. Yeah. Were they were they heavily impacted by what the strokes did to them? Were they um, disabled or did they have deficits that they lived with? Uh, my mom did. My mom ended up um, with kidney failure and uh, with the lupus and on dialysis and stuff. My grandfather, he lived to be um, 92 years old and he was the roving mechanic for Northeastern Utah. And he was just a billy goat and a wonderful individual. Um, and he got, he's had deficits and stuff. And I just thought it was grandpa through the years, you know, but I understand now after having so many strokes myself and what that actually looked like for him, you know, it makes me have a lot more empathy for, and also empathy and encouragement for the tenacity that my grandfather had. And just the sheer grit of that bastard was just absolutely amazing. Those old timers are a different breed, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty amazing. All my yeah. grandfathers, they always called me sweetheart. And they came to me in the hospital when I was catastrophic. And um, I before that, I couldn't get my blood drawn out of my main vein without passing out because of the pressure differential i can taste it and feel it and i just so i worked with psychologists four years to start taking blood draws without passing out and then when i went to, into the hospital that was what that was for was to prepare me for that because i had four ivs going 24 7 um for two and a half months but I was there to, the reason why I was actually there was to be um, kind of a minister to the disembodied human suits because it's really disorienting when you lose your life to, in trauma. You don't know what to do. So I was able to actually be there and help people understand if you want to travel on, feel free. But if there's something you want to stay here for, you're more welcome to come back and that kind of let people pass with a lot more dignity. I think just being the weird person I am. Uh huh. Yeah. You're a minister for the what? For the disembodied human suits. Okay. So where are you doing this work? Uh, it was at the hospital. I was actually on the, um, I was on the cardi cardiac arrest unit floor and that's the most traumatic floor of the hospital. Uh huh. And my window was ace feasting window. And so the sun was coming up in my window and the helicopter would land and the ambulance would show up to unload people. But as they were showing up, I would see their light bodies just poof. And I'm like, oh my God, this is why I am here. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And then when they came to me, my highest self and my grandfather's that going on towards the last days before I started having more of those strokes and getting the MRI machine. They told me the reason why you couldn't hear what we said and was trying to tell you what you was going to face when you're driving here was because we've got to work on you and we need you to participate in it. And so what do you mean? And they said, well, I've had cluster migraines my whole life since a child. And they said, we're going to take these migraines away through some of these strokes, but we need you to actually participate. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And they said, just let your body do what it normally does when you start feeling these odd feelings and work with us. And so I did. 
and I don't understand it, but I said yes to the mystery of it all. That's really the key to a successful life in a human suit, saying yes to the mysteries of life. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. And it was rewired. I have had no cluster migraine since that day. I love that. That is real good advice, regardless of which realm you live in. It's like, say yes to the, what was it? To the? The mysteries and the opportunities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But that's another way of saying, you know, be curious and go with your curiosity and discover and learn and find out about things. Now, your comments earlier, you've had many, many, many strokes in the form of small blood clots, et cetera. And I've had three brain hemorrhages. And when I tell people, they look at me and they go, oh, you don't look like you've had a stroke or, um, or you look great and all that kind of stuff. Now, you definitely don't look like somebody who's had multiple, many, 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 many strokes. So why is that? Why don't you look like a normal supposed stroke survivor who has a deficit, who has a challenge with things why is that you know why can anyone tell you why i can tell everybody why but rather they choose to believe it or not that's up to them um it is because i know who i am and i know where i'm from and i don't want to get all esoteric on you because there's no point in all of that however it's because of my soul and where it's from and what my mission is and I'm here to, there is a lot of veil walkers ambulating the a face of the earth right now. A veil walker is a person that's lost their life in the human suit and came back to the same human suit. There's more of us right now on the face of the earth than any other epoch of humanity. And why we are here specifically at this time is because of this great ascension that is happening in the cosmos that is affecting the human suits on a water planet and human suits are made of water. We are dipole antennas for spirit. Therefore, we are here to help the human suits ground themselves and get in touch with source as much as they can to cleave to the things that are gonna help us progress as a species and there's been four bifurcations that's happened in the last eight years that I've seen and tasted happening and what that all means for us right now is the old things aren't going to suffice ambiguities um, misleadings um, half truths that shit is gone and what's going to happen is the people that are ambulating with the proper heart posture of truth, clarity, and it's almost what you do when you ambulate with a heart posture, you almost, and you will ultimately end up activating your um, clairvoyant mind because we all have clairvoyancy with us and within us. And that was part of the strokes when I thought I was talking. I was communicating to everybody, but oh. they didn't have the same bandwidth to actually Genius. do the telepathy thing. And so that's why I was so befuddled by it all. Uh -huh. Sorry, I talk in circles, but they all yeah, come together. They do. You do talk in circles. Um, it's interesting to hear. So, okay. So then that's a really cool explanation as to why you don't look like you've had a stroke but then you know that you've had a stroke or multiple strokes do any of those multiple strokes affect you with the standard face arm speech type of uh symptoms do you know that it's happened when do you become aware of it and then how do you how does the how do you take action around that since you know about stroke and you've seen people have strokes you're grandfather and your mother well how do, how do you experience a stroke my big ones in 2016 for five years after it felt like my face was this right side of my face was a melted pepperoni pizza just dangling and i'd look at myself in the mirror shake my face and see that that wasn't there 
but I would fill it with my hand and I could fill the drippy cheese and all this weird stuff. And now my whole right side of my body is completely numb. I can't feel my right side of my body, period. And um, I've had to learn how to walk and talk multiples upon multiples. I'm going back to school now. And so I've had to, I've been forced to start writing again. Forced. And the first time I started writing left-handed to try to do that, but it didn't work. Now I'm just doing it with the math and stuff. And for the first two weeks, it looked like I was literally writing some sort of Egyptian glyphs of some sort. It didn't even look like words or letters. I don't understand why, but once I started doing it and the teacher, I'm really open with her and what I'm going through. And she's like, well, try to write this. And I look at her like, are you freaking kidding me? And she looks at me like, yeah, I'm not kidding. <laughs> and so I try it and I'm like, whoa. And I have a mental palate. And when I do it the proper way, what she was telling me, I can feel and taste those new neuro, neuro pathways connecting. And it's like electricity going right through my hand and everything. And I'm like, this is my numb hand too. I'm like, and I'll just, woo. And she looks at me like, what? I'm like, sorry, I just got a little jolt. <laughs> You got to have fun with life and we can be crusty crabs or we can put it on the light side of life and try to laugh through. I'd rather laugh than cry. I've done too much crying in my life. I hear you. So are you on any medication for the conditions that you've been diagnosed with, especially the sticky blood? I imagine that doctors would definitely want you on a blood thinner. They... I'd been on um, Eliquist for years and then the doctor wouldn't refill them. And he told me I had to go on Warfarin. I said, I can't go on Warfarin. He said, why? I said, because blood will squirt out of my belly button. He said, that's impossible. And I'm like, well, I'm not doing it. And he said, well, I'm not filling your meds. And so I went to, to go to the doctors anymore for seven years. And that's how I went catastrophic. Okay. And so when I went to the hospital, they put me on warfarin, and one of the um, nurses, the nurse, nurseologist, she came into the room. I pushed the button in the bathroom, said, "I need to talk to you." Is she you okay? I said, "Yeah, but you just need to come in here." She came. I said, "Brace yourself," and she said, "What's going on?" I stood up and opened my hospital gown, and blood was skirting out of my belly button and squirted all over her and she almost passed out <laughs> and why? why was that happening because warfarin is literally a rat poison that's what it is that's how it thins your blood they use it for rat poison because that's how it kills rats because they bleed to death inside uh -huh. and i'm just this weird ass analogy of human and spirit that works way different than most but how did you know it was and going to bleed out of your belly? And then how was it coming had, out of your belly? I had was no idea other than the fact that I had seen it before. And I don't know where and how, if it was in a different life, or I have no idea. I don't know how to get congruity in these things. Uh -huh. That's the biggest frustration for me, okay. is experiencing the mystic all the time but not having any congruity in it to be able to explain it to other human suits to grab a hold of as a tangible um container for them to understand it human suits you describe us as human suits you don't see yourself in the same way how how do you see yourself and how do you see other people like me um i am a human suit i am completely anchored in this thing again because of dave evland <laughs> uh -huh. but um so to answer your question more poignantly we are all spirit 100 uh percent -huh. and if and spirit has no color and so in one last one of my last lives i was a black woman and when i was a little kid i had drug around this little black baby naked baby doll and my kid, parents would say who is that i said that's me 
And they're like, ha ha, no. And they didn't believe me. And then I found a picture of it in the albums the other day. I'm like, oh my God. I remembered it. Just like, it's like um, Highlander scene of from the Highlander movies. It's a quickening. You just, you just get the memory and the light memory of that time and place. And it's, and so if, if Bill had his full majesty in that beautiful human suit you wear around, it couldn't hold it. You would burst asunder. It's too much plasma, too much light. You couldn't be able to uh, anchor it in your body. So you've got a seventh of your majesty within your human suit. And also these solar flares, they are plasma from the sun and they update us as human suits. When they people tell you don't give them the sun because it'll cause cancer and all this stuff, that's not necessarily the truth. However, the things they sell you to put on your skin that's toxic to you and the water you go in is not good for you. And so if also, if the world had more human suits that were fully activated, that's what I do now. I go around activating people. I have a proclivity for hazel eyed brothers and sisters because I feel like we have a deeper sense of soul. And so when I talk to people and they're hazel eyed, I can start talking to them. And when I start talking to them, the hairs on my arm will start standing up. And that is a spiritual response to something resonating with your spirit. You have muscles in your skin called erector pili muscles. Mm -hmm. And so when things ping on that, your spirit goes, woo. Mm -hmm. And so I start talking to these hazel eyed brothers and sisters and telling them these things. And then they start looking at their own skin and it's doing that. Mm -hmm. And what I do, I said, can I touch you? And if they say yes, I grab their hands and I tell them, whatever made you feel this way right now, cleave to that. That is what ignites your spirit. That's what's going to make you the human suit, angelic host you need to be to help the people around you. And that's kind of how I live my life. And if all the human suits were completely awake and engaged the earth gonna handle it the earth would burst asunder because there's just too much light energy just for our, through our bodies wow. so everything is in balance as it should be rather it sounds crazy or not it just is what it is and i'm just grateful to be part of it Mm -hmm. and be able to see these experiences and taste them in such lavish robust ways do you ever get uh does the you, you've always explained in our conversation you've always explained these things as particularly uh you know they seem to be quite positive experiences does the taste ever become not nice do you ever have experiences where the visions or the visual aspect of it and the, the synesthesia is a not pleasant experience? Yeah, and it's not good. It's not good at all. It's it's like um, all that embodies the thought of what evil might be shows up. Uh -huh. And the worst part for me was in the convalescent centers being completely nonverbal and having the staff um, molest and rape me and stuff because I was just an invalid that couldn't talk from their viewpoint. And when those things were happening to me, it was absolutely the most disgusting, terrible taste on the mental palate you could possibly imagine. It was the closest I can imagine because what it tasted like in the physical was when the second time when my appendix hole ruptured, um it all of those things that i experienced at these times was the same they had that green yellow moldy putrid flavor on the mental palate it's like your soul is being raped mm -hmm. i Were do a lot a of advocacy kid? for human trafficking stuff too because of the way i see things and all that stuff too yeah were you a kid when that was happening to you? 
Uh, no, that was actually as an adult, um, a young adult here in Central Oregon. So you've been nonverbal a few times. Yeah, a lot of times. <laughs> okay, and that those times always ended up in hospitalizations. Ninety nine percent of the time, yeah. Okay, and then were there was anyone ever able to intervene during your um those experiences where other people mistreated you uh did those things get sorted resolved uh people get um taken no nobody came to task for any of those things okay um one of the first ones i was an adult considered an adult and um they put me in a rehabilitation center right here by this building I'm in. And it was a wonderful place. And they had a Zen garden outside and all this beautiful stuff. But there were four patients that were in there too. And they were all women. It wasn't none of the staff that did that, but it was patients themselves. And they had come into my room and did those things to me. And um, then when I got out of those situations, I was a ward of the state and considered um they put me in um adult foster care were you nonverbal as well as catatonic or uh like, what was your state sometimes it comes and it vacillates okay so people to take advantage of a situation like that you would have to be not able to defend yourself is that a state that you yeah. were unable to defend yourself okay and protect yourself. all right completely catatonic just okay all right. So and, you're talking about this very matter of fact. Is it matter of fact? Are you okay talking about this? Have you dealt with this kind of stuff? Have you dealt yeah, with it? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm cool with talking about it. People need to know there needs, there needs to be a picture that's properly painted, especially for this center that I'm about to embark in. Yeah. Do so people, people quite, understand what the, reality could be without having something like this east of the cascades do people find it difficult hanging around with you because your conversation goes to so many places you're the kind of guy in australia we've got this um we've got this thing that we do right which is when you ask somebody hi how are you you're actually not interested in their answer you just say hi how are you and the other person says good and then they say, how are you? And you say, good. And then that's considered it's like it. a long form greeting, right? But you seem like the kind of guy, if I said, hey, Bear, how are you? If I asked you that question, I'm getting a 10 minute answer. Are you, as a result of that, are you difficult to hang around with? Not, I'm not saying that I wouldn't want to hang around with you or whatever, but I find that, that many people, because I've asked you questions, I've tried to make this conversation about stroke it's clearly not going to be about stroke. And I'm cool with that. I'm sorry. And thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. And then it's like, how, how do people interact with you? Do people interact with you? Do they struggle to interact with you? Because I imagine that most people don't want to, I'm prepared to go down this path with you. How do you interact with people? It's so interesting. Um, the poignant answer is the way forward for us now, understanding that. And um, therefore, the people that are close to me in my life, as like my family and stuff, it, I wear them thin quick. Okay. However, out in public and stuff, I'm just a magnet to other people. I mean, people come up to me and start telling me some of the most outlandish stuff that's personal to them that they are going through or have been going through it's because uh -huh. i am that dipole antenna and my energy uh -huh. is um my energy is very enveloping and uh -huh. i am a spirit of unconditional love and a lot of people get it twisted in their own con constructs and uh -huh. their own mental space some people think that I am an entity that wants to be with them and stuff in an intimate way. And it's like, no, I just love you. And whatever mm. you're going through, I'm here for you as much mm. as I can be. 
but that's where it stops. So in public, I, I do very, very well, especially with my devices. I kicked open the door in the ethereal realm again to start the traumatic brain injury awareness group again here in central Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I wear a necklace on my neck that has essential oil in it. That's overwhelming to my factories. So I don't mess up, uh -huh. but there are people more sensitive than me. So I need to charge my um, ozone machine and wear it around my neck. So that way I can be buffered from all these smells, but still not push other people over the edge. Uh -huh. I'm okay. a con very considerate motor mouth, I guess you could say. Okay. So you consider yourself a motor mouth, and that's probably the terminology that somebody might use to describe bear, bear that motor mouth. It just starts talking and it never, end, and it never ends type of situation. I've heard it a lot. Okay. Okay. All right. So you're very aware of yourself. You are quite familiar with how you are experienced in the world by other people, et cetera. Now, I relate to something that you just said. I relate to being in a street with a lot of people. And then I, it's like I get picked out or singled out by the homeless person and they make a beeline for me and they say to me, have you got some change? And there's a thousand people around me and I've, it, it's happened once or twice and I didn't think anything of it, but it happens all the time. And I've started to notice a pattern. And of course I I always go into the central business district with change because I now know that I'm going to get asked. And if somebody asks, I want to be able to give somebody three or $4 um, to buy a coffee or whatever, or to add to their collection of coins so that they can achieve what they need to achieve for that particular day. And also you're the kind of guy that I run into a lot. And I'm not saying that, um, and I say that because I will stop, something will stop me or I'll have an interaction with somebody that seems benign. And then I'll be going into places with them after I've just met them that I shouldn't have ever expected to go. And Likewise. we're having conversations about things we should never have expected. So I can relate to that part. And I get rather than try and, um, wrap people like you up wrap you up and say well i'm done i've got to go or yeah i'm not interested in that i am curious about what they have to say and where and where they're at and what they're talking about and you're not the first person i've come across who's told me about these types of conditions or synesthesia i call them conditions because lack of lack of me being able to describe them but synesthesia and all these experiences and other realms and uh, out of body and in body and crossing the boundaries between the two, you know, I, and then you said something else that's interesting, which is hazel eyed people. Why hazel eyed people? Why not blue? Why not green? Why hazel? And do you know what color my eyes are? I'm assuming they're hazel, but I don't know. Well, there's a bit of green in the middle and they're hazel and they change. But mostly if you look at my eyes, you think they're, they're hazel or brown. People will describe them as brown. If you go a bit closer, you get to see the dark, the green um, tinges. So why hazel? That's the part of the question and um, talking that I will go break into deep esoterica. If it's so narrow it down, you, narrow it down. Give us the, just give me the because answer or the very simple one. Like you said, oh, hazel. Oh. But why not blue? Why not green? Why not black? The hazel is more anchored into the great root race that hasn't been truly activated on this plane yet. The great it has nothing to do with color or ethnicity. Uh -huh. It's actually a spiritual place we're from. Okay. Okay. I knew I had to ask, but I don't know what that means. And maybe we shouldn't go into it, but like I, I had to ask that there was definitely something making me ask. That's cool. Um, so why did you feel the need? Because you seem like you're very able to be adaptable. You're very able to, um, 
come to terms with things that are going on that have happened to you that you're experiencing why did you feel the need to connect with a group of people on an instagram page which is about recovery after stroke what drew drew you to there um everybody that's been through a stroke is just an inspiration to all of humanity rather humanity wants to realize it or not but each one of us are major assets to all the whole of humanity because we've been places that are darker and more disruptive to the soul than 99 percent of the human suits ambulating the face of the earth right now wow that's the short answer i can relate to that i know what you mean okay so what do you feel like a kinship with people who've had a stroke one more time please do you feel like a kinship with people who have had a stroke yes absolutely i feel like they're my they brothers the... and sisters on okay. different level than other people can possibly comprehend okay i was going to ask you are they the people you relate to the most yep okay oh i, I get it because that... usually we're the most looked down on in society as well just how things happen i don't understand it but i see it and i taste it and with me how i understand how i affect others i can feel and taste their energy and if people are more attracted and wanted to talk to me i can feel it and hear it a block away Mm -hmm. and i've had a choice in the past part of my life to where i could run away from it and i have and they always find me anyways so I've decided to stop running from anything and I needed to know, I know I'm about to, you're actually the springboard for me into what I'm walking into now. And I really appreciate this opportunity more than I can possibly properly convey, but I am about to enter a phase of my life um, of international speaking engagements of different kinds and sorts and i really needed to break this ice for myself and my own consciousness to say you can do this Mm -hmm. don't be afraid Mm -hmm. don't be a scaredy bear but be that warrior heart that you are Mm -hmm. and faith with integrity poignancy and please don't walk in circles there but i did anyways (laughs) Uh uh-huh the warrior heart is interesting term that you use. Tell me what is a warrior heart? Because one of the things that stroke survivors miss in their recovery is doing the work that's related to the heart, the heart, the emotional work. So what they do is because we're such a head-based society, we all do the um, head-based recovery. It's like, we'll have to fix the brain because the brain's, brain's been damage which i agree with it's perfectly fine we get stuck there and often then people who can't walk or move one of their limbs we go into a physical recovery but very rarely do i come across stroke survivors who have had the emotional recovery or the heart-based recovery and in my book there's a chapter called the heart brain bear so tell me why why the warrior heart how do you come up with that term what does that mean the warrior heart um, for me personally, the most poignant I can put it without going into all the rabbit trails that need to be gone into to flush it out properly. Mm-hmm. Um, William Wilberforce is the original um, abolitionist in the modern era. He is the um, English um, parliamentary that got the abolishment of the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. I am a complete um, abolitionist at heart. So I have to feed my heart properly to be able to properly um, ambulate my mission and and execute my mission in this human suit because I'm done. This I'm not reincarnating to this place again. So I've got things I have to get done. And I that puts a lot of fire in my soul 
and um, still into my words. Mm -hmm. Your experience, your out of body, out of the human suit experience that you have, is that a heart based experience? If you are able to associate it to uh, an intelligence in your body, is that a heart based experience? Because we have neurons in our gut, we have neurons in our eyes, we have neurons in our brain, we have neurons in our heart. Um, there's neurons throughout our nervous system. And I consider them intelligences. Um, the eyes, for example, are uh, part of your brain and they are um, the external part of the brain. They are part of the brain that has evolved to be outside of the head to bring in information and allow us to transverse the planet and to get around and to be safe and to avoid obstacles and all that type of stuff to give us inf information. So your out of, out of human suit experience is what kind of experience can you associate it to in the human realm in our um it is con it's connected to heart but it is completely other than heart it is people that are very religiously dogmatic understand it to a very 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 fine detail because of their dogmas and the different rituals and the different elations they get from their different religious practices so it's pure un unbridled um spirituality for me it's just i am living my naked self my soul bared to the universe and my heart is on fire just doing battle in the angelic realms and that's who I am. I'm a warrior. And um, I imagine when I was a black woman, I was probably a beautiful Amazonian warrior as well, I'm assuming. Because <laughs> that's my soul, you know? Why not? What do you hope to speak about when you get uh, to the stage? Um. the enlightenment that needs to come to human suits for their own development and treating each other the way it needs to be done none of us are more important than the other we're all super interconnected possibly way more than we can possibly imagine we are the universe experience expressing itself through these human suits and once we grab a hold of that literally in our own minds and souls that is when the biggest shift for humanity is actually going to anchor in and new days are on the way i just need to figure out a better way and polish myself enough to not do my rabbit trail dribble drabble that makes people nauseated by talking to me <laughs> yeah that'll be part of your training you're going to have to uh come up with a script uh practice that script memorize it you know have a opening have a middle part have a conclusion and um stick to it and then just practice and practice and practice and get to the point where you can just get that out make sure it delivers the message and then and then leave it at that because uh, you know those spaces are always limited for time and um deep dives into these types of things are not always possible but it'd be very interesting to hear you deliver such a well-structured very precise... i'm interested in see what it's going to sound like too yeah because you're I've never i've never shirked away from anything in my life if things scare me i jump in and as an adult, I worked on the drilling rigs. I was scared of heights, but I always worked on the derricks 300 feet above the ground when things are moving and made to sway because I was scared of it. 
I've always been scared of snakes. So I catch every snake I can see, so I'm not scared of it. I was scared to public speak. And so here I am talking to Bill, yeah. doing the damn thing. Yeah, it's good. This is a gentle way to get into a speak publicly because it doesn't have to be too structured. We can go all over the place. It doesn't really matter, right? But on a stage, yeah, you have to be a little, a little more uh, restricted in the way Polished. that you go about. Yeah, which is cool. Um, I notice when you answer a lot of my questions, you look up and your eyes kind of tend to tuck back behind your eyelids. Is that uh, what? Is that something that allows you to access? the areas or the places where you need to go to to get answers how or is that just a a, a a human physical trait that you just have no that's i'm actually getting memory and pulling pulling my memory answers down out of my database because we're all human computers rather okay. realize it or not that's pretty and normal so i look up to grab my information to come back to you that's pretty common because people do that. Most people do that, um, access their memories either by, by looking up and to the left or up and to the right. Most people will look up and to the left, um, but you're just more obvious. You have a very prominent uh, way of going there. You go there with both eyes and it's almost straight up rather than up and to the left. And you spend a lot more time there than most people. I taste it. That's. Uh -huh. I think that's why I'm lingering because I'm actually getting the flavors and the textures of everything I talk about is so deep and so beautiful mm -hmm. and trying to put it, that into poignant words is mm -hmm. tough, especially mm -hmm. for such a elaborate soul as mine. Uh-huh. Okay. I get it. So I'm going to ask you the three questions that a lot of people get asked in the podcast or stroke survivors as we wrap up the episode um what is the hardest thing about stroke for you um the lack of empathy the world shows stroke patients is what burns me worse than anything fair enough what has stroke taught you resilience Mm -hmm. tenacity and what do you want to tell other stroke survivors and allow yourself to go beyond the two word answer for this next question which is what do you want to tell other stroke survivors who are going through something similar uh that we've been through or just on their journey or they're a little bit confused they found this podcast they don't know how to deal with it all. What do you want to tell other stroke survivors? What would be your, your words of wisdom? Not only are you important, but you're an inspiration to this world and to other human suits that have no comprehension to what you're going through. And the lack of empathy that they show you should help foster and grow tenacity in your soul to be able to articulate properly the depths and beauty of your own soul to the world around you because you are an asset to this world like no other you got this shit you're inspiration to all of us kick ass <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome but Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Likewise, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. To get a copy of my book about stroke recovery, go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash book. To learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and to download a transcript of the entire interview, go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. Thank you to everyone who has already left a review uh, about the podcast on Spotify and iTunes. It means the world to me. Uh, podcasts live and thrive because of reviews. And when you leave a review, you're helping others in need of this type of content to find it easier. And that is making their stroke recovery just that little bit better. 
go ahead and leave a review and a few words about what you think the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. I would deeply appreciate it. We wouldn't have been able to get to episode 300 if people hadn't supported the podcast in the way that they do by sharing it, commenting on YouTube videos and leaving reviews on iTunes and Spotify. So I really appreciate it. If you're watching on YouTube and you comment below the video, you will get a response from me. Uh, if you like this episode, that really helps as well because uh, YouTube then uh, makes sure that other people get to see these videos. If you're a stroke survivor with a story to share about your stroke experience, come and join me on the show. Interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor who wants to share your story in the hope that you are going to help somebody else going through something similar. If you have a commercial product that you would like to promote that is related to supporting stroke survivors to recover, there is also a path for you to join me on a sponsored episode for the show. For anyone who's interested in reaching out to me, go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the form explaining briefly which category you belong to, and I will respond with more details about how we can meet via Zoom. Thank you again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.